Hi everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today I have with me Jared Smith, a former tick and heroin addict who used to live on the streets involved in gangsterism, crime, alcoholism and prostitution. So in today's video we're going to be sharing with you at home as parents the 10 lessons that Jared has learned from his journey that he would like to share with you. Jared, thank you for being here. Pleasure. If you guys want to know more about Jared's journey, please check out our other video which I will link in the description down below. But Jared, today we're here to help parents. Is that something that you do on a regular basis with all the work you do in schools? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we do the parent workshops and more than that, I'm always getting phone calls from parents from all over the place with kids and um, struggling with their teenagers or their, you know, can I help, can I chat to them? Yes. So it's just uh, our society worldwide, kids are in trouble. Um, with all the things that are available to them yes um, and how normalized it has become what is the first and foremost lesson that you've learned from your journey when it comes to alcoholism and addiction it can happen to anyone why do you say that i know people that come from the poorest areas whose parents are gangsters and drug addicts they study under a candle and become a doctor mm. then i've got people that are living in bishop's court got all the money, got all the opportunities, got all the rugby or the cricket or whatever. The talent. talent. Taking Xanax, smoking weed, going out, doing coke. Jared, did you come from a good background? Yeah, I came from a good home. Like, if you, if you look at my family on paper, there's no reason, and I always say this, there's no reason that I had to do what I did. Even the, the trauma, I didn't have to do that. Um, it's a choice that I made. How you deal with what happens to you is always a choice. There's always a choice in it. What about kids? What about situations yeah. where parents feel there's no way my child, my little Daniel or yes. my little George is ever going to touch drugs? He's I, too good. Yeah, I think that's a lie. I think your little Daniel, your little George uh, has the potential to possibly use or drink and has possibly drank or used already. It's, it's that sort of blasé mindset that gets your kids into trouble. I think that's also a way of avoiding the reality of what could possibly be happening because you don't want to deal with it because your life's too busy. So Jared, can good kids do bad things? Good kids can make negative choices, not because they're bad, but because they're hurting inside. What is the second lesson that parents should know? Well, secrets make you sick. And I think, I think parents need to be careful not to create an environment at home where their kids want to lie. I know it's very hard, it's very complex. I, I, I remember my dad said to me, just be honest and you won't get a hiding. And I was honest and I got a hiding. Mm. So parents' reactions to kids' honesty is very important. Mm. You want to breed honesty, even though your kids are still going to lie. But I think uh, kids today are, are walking around with so many secrets and those secrets are keeping them sick. And those secrets are heavy, hence they look for places to offload and it's normally unhealthy places. What do you do as a parent when you want to enforce consequences to their behavior, to limit the behavior, but you also don't want to discourage them being honest. So I think, I think it's always about response and not consequence. So what I'm saying is it's the way you respond. <clears throat> a lot of parents, when they find out things that um, they didn't know, they rev, start shouting, start screaming, calling the kid's name, you idiot, stupid, why did you do that, do anything? If you keep calm, talk it through, but yet still give a consequence. So what does that do? So it's more, it's more like you're engaging. You're not, you're not belittling. You're saying, my son, my daughter, okay, tell me what happened. You know, what can you learn from this? Why did you do Why it? Why did you do it? You know, just calm. And then say, you do understand, I need to, I need to teach you because I love you and there's going to be a consequence. And you give the consequence. And it's, it's, for me, it's never about the consequence. It's more about the way you respond to the situation that's going to make the difference. Okay, so... Because by, by, by you not giving a consequence, you're doing what my dad did. You, you, you're not teaching them that choices have consequences. Yes. Because then you fall on the side of trying to be the nice parent. Yes. You, it's, it's, it's a, that's why I say it's quite complex. It's very complex. You, you just got to try and keep calm, come down to the level, speak it through, listen to them, listen why, ask questions, mm. and then say, I appreciate the honesty, but I love you and I need to teach you. And the consequence doesn't have to necessarily be harsh, but, you know. What is an example of a consequence that is productive? Well, find, find what your kid really loves and take it away. 
iPad. Phone. Phone. Friends, money. Just for a short time, let them feel. Okay. What is the next lesson? Lesson number three. Spend time, not money. I think society has become so busy. People have become so busy. They'd rather give their kids money as a way of showing love than spending time with them. Do you see this a lot? Yeah, and that's why kids are rebellious. They, they, they're screaming for love. They're screaming for attention. They're screaming for affirmation from their mother and father. By doing what kind of things? Drinking, parties, lying, sleeping around. The, the usual, as they call it. They want attention. They want attention, yeah. Sometimes girls are even looking for their fathers in a male figure that's a little bit older than them. And they're looking for that in sex. So mm. she could be 16 sleeping with a 24 year old, mm. looking for the connection. So what is a way in which parents can give the child a sense of connection and quality time? Well, I think parents need to become aware of if they the parents that, that are giving money instead of time. And yes. how do they reverse and start giving the kids more time and less money? But don't you think parents are sometimes a little bit estranged? They don't know how to engage with their child. Here's a wealthy business person. Yeah. He's in his 50s. Yeah. His child's in his teens. What do they really have in common? But How do they engage on a level that makes them connect? I think it's more about, um, and it will be uncomfortable for a lot in the beginning, mm. but taking your son or your daughter out for lunch and just talking. How's school? What's happening? You know, like, what are some of your challenges? Um, how are your friends? Keep, and, that's, and, and, and building that momentum. Obviously, the first few times might be awkward. The, the son and daughter might not even want to be there, but you know, as you show a bit of attention, you sort of make that a habit. In a non-judgmental space. Yeah, it's not about crapping them out or it's just about chatting and spending quality time. Because what does that do to a child? How does that make a child feel? It makes them feel loved and validated and seen. A lot of kids feel unseen, unheard. So, Jared, what is the next lesson? Build boundaries, not barriers. And what that means is this. I think parents can also get quite stressed out with what's happening in society, mm. almost neurotic. Mm. And what they do is they actually are over the top, mm. overbearing. They end up building barriers, which cause the kids to be rebellious rather than healthy boundaries. Give an example. Oh. So a boundary is be home at 11. A boundary is I will check your phone if I want to. Mm. A boundary is I will only give you X amount of pocket money. So, you know what I'm saying? Mm. A boundary is you only can watch TV on the weekends. Yeah? Okay. Can't, you, can, you can only play your PlayStation or online games on the weekends. Stuff like that. Okay. A, a barrier would be someone that, a, a parent that's so neurotic out of fear where they won't want their kids to go out at all. They're like, yeah. no, no, you can't go out. Or you can only play games on, on, on holidays. You've got to study now. So yeah. They're like overbearing, yeah. you know, um, out of fear. Um, they want to know where they are 24-7, I get it. Um, they're yeah. almost like obsessive. And I, and I don't judge the parents because things are hectic out there. But you actually, you actually then um, uh, smother the child to a point where they can't breathe and then they rebel. Mm. It's, it's, yeah, it's very hard being a parent, eh? finding the balance. What is the next big lesson for parents? I think time management is important. Like what are kids doing with their time? Mm. Um, like are they playing sport? Um, are they releasing natural endorphins? Um, because a lot of kids today come home from school, do their homework, and then they vegetate in front of the TV, they play online games. On their um, phone. On their phone. Um, and it's, it's really not healthy. Um, so I think time management is, is so important for kids. Um, and I really feel like sport is an important thing, mm -hmm. or some sort of activity yes. um, where, where their brain is stimulated outside of school. Yes. What's the next lesson for parents? The hardest one is be a healthy parent, not a cool parent. What's the difference? So a cool parent is someone who tries to be cool with their kids. They try and be their kid's best friend. There's a time for that. I think when kids are teenagers, um, your, time, your time when they're teenagers is to prepare them for life. When they're 24, 25, then you can be their best friend. But you know, when they're teenagers, you have to be the healthy parent. You have to be strict. Sometimes they're not gonna like you. Sometimes you're gonna be called names. Sometimes you're going to have to take away things from them that they really love and they're going to scream and shout. But at the end of the day, we can't avoid that. Um, I think we're living in a society where a lot of parents are trying to be the cool parents, giving alcohol too young, 
letting them go to places they shouldn't go, letting them wear what they shouldn't wear. There's a lot of things because they don't want to ruffle up the feathers. They want to mm. be the cool in parent, you know. But we've we got to be a healthy parent. We've got to do what's right for them, even if they don't like us for a period of time. What's the next lesson, Jared? Don't stigmatize the need for kids to get help. Um, we were recently at a school, a very influential school, and a girl said that her parents are both doctors and they don't believe in mental health issues. She struggles with anxiety sure. and she's actually had to pay for a psychiatrist out of her own pocket money and her parents don't know because they don't believe anxiety is a real thing. Oh my goodness. So we need to normalize it and we need to let our kids have a voice that if they're struggling with anxiety or depression, we need to say, we, if we don't understand, understand, learn, yes. uh, or, or let them get help. I think what happens is this, sometimes parents have an ego where they're scared that if people find out their kids are struggling with something, it's a reflection on them, a bad yes. reflection on them. Yes. So they don't want their perfect picket fence picture to be disrupted. Yes. Meanwhile, their, their kids are dying. Or suffering. Suffering. That's very true. It's about their ego. For sure. All right, Jared, now that we've covered these very important principles, what are the red flags that a parent can look out for that will signal a potential addiction problem? So I think a constant need for money. I think a, a decrease in schoolwork. Um, I think a change in eating patterns, a change in sleeping patterns, mm -hmm. um, uh, red eyes. The eyes are red. A lot of the times kids also, if you ever find like um, saffirs, eye drops in their kid's cupboard, then they're definitely smoking weed because they use saffirs to make their eyes white after they smoked weed because they're red. What else? Uh, speaking a lot. You, when, I, when, I, when I say these things, you know your child. So yes. these are behaviors outside of the norm. Yes. They're speaking a lot. All of a sudden, they, they normally don't speak a lot. Now they're speaking, speaking a lot. There could okay. be a thing. Um, what is that a sign of? Uh, drugs. Like they are, it could uppers. be uppers, yeah. Um, sleeping more than we would normally sleep, looking quite lethargic, uh, slurring in speech. Is um, that weed? Could be Xanax or weed. Um, munchies, eating, like I said, eating a lot. I think I've said that already. Um, That's weed. Yeah. If you're doing your kids washing, pull out their pockets and look at the, the, the I think it's the hem. Sometimes there will be tobacco or little bits of weed or stuff in there from their okay. pockets. Okay. So that's also a, a good thing. And then normally kids will hide things in their room. So like they will hide it in like, uh, if it's for glasses, like a, like, you know, your, like a pair of glasses, it'll be in something like that. So they hide their, their paraphernalia yes. in objects that seem normal. Loss of weight, um, constantly on their phone, hanging around different friends, new circle of friends all of a sudden, wanting to go out all the time, um, not, not sticking to curfews when coming home, uh, yeah, that's, that's about it. Taylor. And schoolwork, so... So schoolwork de declines. So when the child stops performing at school? No, just there's a difference. There's a difference. Um, and the thing is, parents are so afraid to drug t test their kids. Why don't you just randomly test them? Can you do it with a urine stick? Yeah. So, and I would recommend the six panel because it adds the benzos in there. That's Xanax. Where can you get it? Uh, from the pharmacies. Six okay. panel. Six or seven panels are better. Because a lot of the kids are doing the Xanax, the Benzos these days. So, is that yeah. a big thing now? Yeah, Xanax is huge. That's terrible because that's for anxiety. Yeah, but a lot of them are anxious. About what, Jared? Uh, schoolwork, performance, life, fitting in, looking good enough, being beautiful enough. Lastly, Jared, what can a, what can a parent do if they're worried that the child has a problem? What's the first step? Well, as I said, I think if, you, if you're worried your child has a problem, find out if that problem is real. Drug test them. Find out if they've got a problem. Test them. If it's negative. Test but again. Test again randomly. Um, if you really think they've got a problem and they're cheating your tests, then set up a counseling session with a drug counselor. Where would one or go life. where would one go to find a counselor? You can Google it. I mean you can also check our website, Second Chance, we got a few counsellors. Um, also when drug testing your kids, please make sure I know this sounds hectic but please make sure you actually in the bathroom with them and see them weeing because mm. they will add all sorts of stuff in there um, that'll cheat the test okay okay um, that's a good tip yeah it's hectic but it's <laughs> it's important 
Um, so yeah, get a counselling and let a drug counsellor maybe fish a bit and um, find out what the, what the issue is because sometimes the kids don't want to talk to the parents. Perfect. Thanks so much for watching, guys. I really hope you enjoyed this and found it incredibly useful. If you guys want to know more about Jared's journey, it is very intricate and um, very harrowing. It definitely is a cautionary tale. Please check out our other video, which I will link in the description down below. If you'd like to know more, please visit Jared's website, www.secondtrance.ca.ca. If you enjoyed it, please like this video, subscribe to my channel and leave a comment down below. Bye!